Hello everyone, Mr. Waz here, and welcome to another episode of Wazly Science. In this episode, we're going to be discussing land management. We're going to discuss such topics as the need for things, uh, leaching, types of waste, types of hazardous waste, landfills, incineration, bioremediation, biodegradation, phytoremediation, and much more. So let's get started. I want you to think right now that a meteor is going to crash into your house and you have very little time. You have to act immediately and you can only grab five things in your house. doesn't matter how big or heavy they are, but you can only grab five. Write them down right now. Write down the five things that you just couldn't live without. They have to be stuff too. Go ahead. Write them down. You can press pause. Are you done? How happy do these things make you? Go ahead, scale it from 1 to 10. How many of these things require electricity? Where do these things come from? Where were they made? How long do your things last before you need to buy new ones? How long did you grab your favorite pair of shoes? Do they last you 6 to 8 months? How much do your things even cost? $50, $200, $1,000? How do your things get disposed? Do they get recycled, broken down, do you just throw them away? Do you put them in a drawer and just forget about them? I want you to think about these things right now. They have a lot to do with land management, believe it or not. Carl Sagan said a really good quote. It's one of my favorite ones. We live in a society absolutely dependent on science and technology, and yet have cleverly arranged things so that almost no one understands science and technology. That's a clear prescription for disaster. What he's saying right there is that we live in this world in which we just work, and when we obtain money, we just purchase the things we need. And yet we have no idea of understanding how these things work. And we seem to not really care. We seem to find other things to worry about. I remember being on an airplane and, and flying. I'm flying in the air. I'm going really fast. I'm getting to Florida in three hours. It's amazing. And yet the person next to me is like, well, yeah, well, I don't have Wi-Fi. Who cares? You're flying. Don't you want to know how you got there? No one cares. We just don't seem to really mind that anymore. And we have dis disconnected ourselves with how things are made, where they're made, what happens to them when they get thrown away. And because of that, we are now faced with many problems with the space we have left on this planet and the pollutants that we are introducing into the land and the amount of resources that we have left. In class, we watched a video called The Story of Stuff. If you haven't watched it yet, you really need to. It's by Annie Leonard. And she talks about how the planet runs on a linear system when it comes to using materials. And that the problem is that we don't live on a planet that produces an infinite amount of resources for us. It can produce a sort of infinite amount of resources like trees grow after you chop some down trees grow back however the rate at which we use these resources is so fast that the earth is having trouble keeping up with it so there always will be oil being made by ancient plants breaking down into coal oil or natural gas but we use it up so fast that the amount of energy that it takes for us to get other fossil fuels is greater than the amount of energy that we would get out of it in the first place. So we are running on a very inefficient system. It's very important that you do watch this video. It really opens your eyes. I know that it's, she's very far left in this situation, but you kind of got to put that aside and and see what that she's talking about here is a pretty big global problem especially that we who live in the United States take a lot of responsibility for it so that we can do something different because if we do something different then it can make a dramatic difference on the rest of the world and here's why we as Americans can make a big difference we generate over four pounds of trash a day each of us do that translates to 600,000 tons per day for America and 210 million tons per year. That's a lot of garbage. Why are we producing so much of this? Well, we want more stuff. 
And there's a term that talked about in Story of Stuff called planned obsolescence, which is the term meaning that stuff is designed to break down at an amount of time that we see okay for it to break down that fast and not work anymore. So we go buy more stuff rather than stuff having great endurance and last in many, many years like it used to back in the day. And we also have an increased use of plastic, which plastic does not break down. Plastic is not biodegradable. We also have a much higher population. We're at seven to eight billion people now. People are consuming more stuff and our stuff isn't lasting as long as it used to. I mean, I'm sure you got grandpa who still has his fridge from the 1950s and the thing still works somehow and it just surprises you. You know, and it, it's, it, you take the same thing with, with shoes. Shoes used to last years and years and years. Now, at best, they'll last you half a year. I mean, that's, that's not fair. Shoes should last a lot longer than that. It's one thing when you're a kid and you're growing, but when you're an adult, it's very frustrating that your shoes are done after half of a year. Believe me, I can tell you that. We as a world are in serious problems. Have you ever heard of the Pacific Garbage Patch? The Pacific Garbage Patch is located around right here to the west of California. And what it is, is that the way that the ocean currents work, all the garbage that ends up in the ocean ends up in one sort of concentrated spot. And it finds itself on these islands over here. Um, please click on these videos to watch more about the Pacific Garbage Patch. It's absolutely devastating. And what's sad is, on these islands there are these birds called albatross and albatross are these beautiful migrating birds that that dedicate most of their lives to the same to the same other bird and they will fly out to get a fish and and bring it back for its loved one and their babies and they in the males often like to capture colorful things to bring back to their mate and unfortunately, there are many colorful things around these islands. Garbage, bottle caps, lighters, lots of, lots of different things. And, and, the, and the males will eat them all and swallow them. And they can't take them out of their stomach. So, and they don't break down. So they just accumulate over time. And then the bird's stomach fills up with so much garbage that the bird dies. And when the bird breaks down and, and decomposes, you can still see the, the, a little pile of trash all over these islands that are the last part of their body decomposing. It's, it's awful. And it's, it's, this is a serious problem that all this trash is not making its way to any landfill or any incinerator because we use too much of it and we're just so separated from understanding where our garbage goes. So it ends up in places like this. Sorry to uh, be a downer. Well, I feel like the beginning of this video is a lot like the uh, Pixar Up movie, but all right, maybe I got your attention now. So there's three types of waste. You got your biodegradable waste, which is their origin is from living materials, and these are able to break down easily from microorganisms like bacteria. That's good. We want that. And then there's non-biodegradable waste. This is discarded substances that are not biodegradable, and they can be potentially dangerous if they're not properly recycled glass, metal, plastics, those type of things are not biodegradable. They don't break down. Glass doesn't break down for like a million years. Metal could take over 500 years. Plastic can take very, very, very long, let's just say. We have no idea how long plastic can last. And then you got your hazardous waste. This is discarded chemicals or biological substances that are potentially dangerous to us humans. And if they find their way into the ground and then eventually into the groundwater, we could have a really serious problem. So those are the three types of waste. There are five ways we can classify hazardous waste. So first is that it could be flammable or explosive, like anything involved with oil, oil filters. Then you can have corrosive, which just means acidic. So batteries, obviously, are very acidic. They have battery acid in them. And then you can have things that are reactive, like bleach, like ammonia. So when bleach and ammonia mix together, they make chloride gas, which is very deadly. We don't want that happening in a landfill or an incinerator. 
And then you got things that are toxic. So CFL light bulbs have drops of mercury in them. We don't want to mix them in with an incinerator landfill because we don't want that mercury going anywhere. And then you have things that are infectious, like infected animals, like their, their, their feces. All right, so these are all different things that we don't want ending up in a landfill or incinerator because if they all mix together and get into the groundwater, that could be a very serious issue. So we like to put these things somewhere else. It's time you understand the difference between a dump and a landfill. So a dump was used back in the day and they were located just a little bit outside of town and everyone from town would come together and throw their trash in the same pile. So basically a dump was a pile of trash and there was no regulations of what went into the dump. There was no regulations of like liner that went into the dump and the problem was that there was major odor in rodent problems and also that the dump would just kind of go into the groundwater so all the when when all the trash would pile together and eventually get into the ground it would mix with the groundwater or even find itself in the river because a lot of times the dumps were near a river then we came up with sanitary landfills and it was the same idea but a little better this time so with landfills not only do we put a liner on the bottom so that the garbage can't get into the ground but we put a little soil on it each day so that way there's not as much odor problems it doesn't stink as bad and rats have a hard time getting to all the trash as well so smaller amount of rodent, pro rodent problems less fire problems the trash used to be able to combust and catch on fire because when all the different things would mix in and also less leaching of chemicals from the landfill we're going to talk more about what leaching is in uh, just a few minutes all right, so here's the steps of how you get yourself a landfill. Step one is to collect all the trash. Step two, after you have collected enough trash, you need to cap off the trash. So there is a cover that goes on top there. And we're gonna talk about more what all this means. And then step three, you can turn your landfill into a sports park. Pretty cool, right? You can make it into a golf course or a soccer field, you name it because grass can grow right on top. Pretty cool. There are two types of landfills. We have the sanitary landfill and the secure landfill. For the sanitary landfill, they're a specialized location that gets selected, and then they put liners, which you can see here by the uh, sort of checkered border. That is actually a very strong plastic liner that they put all around it to protect the solid waste from ever entering the groundwater. We don't want that. So they, they, um, they pack all the trash very firmly. They put uh, layers of soil each day to prevent any odor or rodent problems. And then they also have pipes that are going, so these pipes are actually going towards the screen right now. And they are there to monitor to make sure that the waste is not going through the sediment. And then worse, there's mo and they got monitors even below the plastic liner so they can see if the waste has in fact left the liner and gone into the soil and eventually they in, into the groundwater. So they also have monitoring wells that check the quality of of the groundwater make sure that there is no garbage going in there so lots and lots of monitors all around that would be the ideal situation and most of them do now and they also put make sure they like to have clay be the material that the landfill sits on top because clay it creates an impervious surface we talked about what that means it means that water can't come through it, it means it's very solid very dense so a secure landfill is very similar it has a liner as well but it's just more secure in a simple sense it has p stones that are on the bottom it has more um, 
more monitor systems. They gotta have clay on the bottom. They don't like to have, they don't like to put these where the water, groundwater can get very high. So drier areas are ideal for hazardous waste landfills. Um, they put lots of sand in between. And then they have a, they usually have some sort of leachate collection system in which, um, well, I haven't yet explained what leachate is, but it's basically garbage juice. So they take the garbage juice and they try to get rid of it and then put it somewhere else, which I don't really know what the next step from a secure landfill is. You've been hearing this word leaching and leachate. It's time to talk about what that is. I always think of it in the simple sense is garbage juice. And I say that it's kind of funny, but when you have piles of trash, the piles on top press down on the piles on the bottom and they get more and more, they have more pressure and the pressure makes them more dense and they start to kind of mold in together with each other and the bottom of a landfill usually ends up being very liquidy and juicy and that's why I call it garbage juice. And so this stuff can mix with one another and become sort of corrosive and toxic and pretty powerful stuff and sometimes it can eat away the liner and when it, it's even worse is when you have a lot of sharp pointy things on the bottom of a landfill and they're all piercing through the liner so eventually what could happen is you could have leachate enter through the liner and into the ground water and this is called leaching as water from rain in it doesn't help when rain and water gets into the landfill as well and goes into the bottom of the landfill and piles up on top and it can carry these dissolved chemicals into the groundwater and sometimes if it's hazardous waste like fertilizers and other things you could have this making its way into the groundwater as well and it's a very serious thing it could lead to a lot. We, um, landfills have a lot of environmental problems, such as leaching, but here's a couple more. Um, methane emits into the air from landfills, which methane is a greenhouse gas. We've talked about that before, and it's explosive. So uh, yeah, landfills can be explosive if you have a lot of methane that builds up. It can create even strong odor. And what they do is they put pipes around landfills so that the methane gets emitted from the landfill at a slow and safer rate rather than all at once. Landfills reduce the value of property. So if your house is right next to a landfill, it's a little tough to sell it. They can even become a physical disruption. Um, people don't like looking at landfills. And possible groundwater pollution which I've been saying over and over that's called leaching. I just want to make you familiar with a term municipal solid waste. It's basically garbage. It's just a fancy term for garbage but it's important that you know it because sometimes with cap test instead of just saying garbage they say municipal solid waste. But anyway it's just solid waste from homes, office buildings, restaurants, basically anywhere but industries, factories, power plants. And there's strategies for dealing with municipal solid waste, of course recycling, and biological breakdown, biodegradation, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. But I just want to get you familiar with the term municipal solid waste because you may see it. They call it MSW sometimes too. All right, so I, I always want you guys to know every sort of way that information can get presented to you. All right, so there's two videos on landfills. Um, they're quite hilarious. You got to watch them. The one on the left is like so depressing the way that they explain landfills. Like there just absolutely is no hope. And the one on the right is kind of for kids, but it's it does a really good job at explaining how landfills work and how we get trash there and keep it maintained and and make it all work so make sure you watch both of these videos last year we had a great time watching them maybe we'll even watch them in class too for our enjoyment all right so yes we can we can put trash in the ground and leave it and wait, hope, let it break down there's another thing we can do with trash which is actually what we do with the majority of our trash which we burn it and that's called incineration. So there's a video on the bottom left here. 
that you can watch that explains how incineration works. It's pretty interesting because what's very cool about incineration is that we can generate electricity by burning the waste. So we can actually turn garbage into electricity. And also the burning of waste can significantly reduce the volume of trash by 90%. That's a huge amount. So 10% of the trash by volume ends up just being this like ash. So then we could take the ash and we could throw that in a landfill. There are some downsides here. When we burn the trash, the pollutants that were in the trash go into the air and they can release dioxins. The story of stuff talked about this and dioxins can cause cancer. So if there is no wet scrubbers and baghouse filters, which we learned about in unit seven, we're going to have a big problem with incineration. But for the most part, they usually are there. So everything is okay. This diagram shows us the locations of incinerators, although there's probably more by now. This might be outdated, but we do have one in Bristol. We do have one in Hartford and Bridgeport. And that's where a lot of your own trash gets sent to. Your trash gets sent to the incinerator, just like Toy Story 3. All right, so now what I'd like to do is to compare landfills and incinerators. So it's very important in your notes right now that you take a piece of paper and make a T-chart because it's going to compare the difference between a landfill and incinerator. So first off, new landfills with liners, good liners, are really the safest way to contain waste and prevent waste from entering the atmosphere or the ground. Incinerators, though, require a much smaller amount of space than landfills do. And they can remove 90% of our waste, like I said before. They also, incinerators, will often sort the waste better because they use those giant magnets that will grab the metal. And then they can even have different sorters, which will take the plastic. But some, some things do that before they even go to the landfill. With landfills, methane gas is collected. And we can even use the methane gas that's collected from landfills to generate electricity, which is starting to happen now. So that's pretty cool. That's a little bit newer than the incinerators producing electricity. And um, the heat that gets burned from incinerators can even use, be used to heat nearby homes. Um, but on the other side, landfills can become sports parks, golf, golf courses, even ski resorts. I don't know if I would go on that ski resort. I don't know if that's really happened yet. That'd be kind of cool. So a continuation of this, um, if there are landfills that are not lined, you can have leaching incurred, which is never a good thing. Hazardous waste can get mixed into the groundwater, so you can have things like battery acid, mercury from bulbs, heavy metals from electronics going into the groundwater. They are also very unattractive and I think I've already said this, but they take up a lot of space. And they can, in, both incinerators and landfills can increase traffic in an area. And the reason they do that is because all, you got all the garbage trucks coming around. And they usually come around the same time of the day and they cause traffic, um, especially right near the landfill and the incinerator because they got to travel on the same roads as everyone else. Um, with incinerators, you can release more air pollutants than you can with landfills. Landfills don't really release any air pollutants. They only release the greenhouse gas, methane. But you guys know these. Carbon monoxide, dioxins, particulate matter 10, even particulate matter 2.5. All those things get released from incinerators. And in, the, in, the, in other Toxic chemicals can get released. If they're not sorted properly, then they get burned. They're also unattractive, too. People just don't like stuff with smokestacks. I don't know. They're just not into them. Maybe we should just put, like, a candy cane stripe around the smokestack, and that'll make people happy. But uh, that is our comparison for landfills and incinerators. Very general. The videos have even more information if you watched those before. So if you'd like, you can take the information from the videos and add even more to these t-charts. That would be extremely helpful in preparation for the assessment on this.
Biodegradation. This is a term that you are actually already familiar with. When we were discussing the carbon cycle, we were discussing decomposition, which is a natural process of materials breaking down by, micro, by microorganisms, aka bacteria, consuming them. And different materials can biodegrade or decompose at different rates. As we know from before, sunlight, water, and oxygen are all needed in order for biodegradation to occur. And if there's more of these things, sometimes they can break down even quicker. And the temperature, how hot it is, and also the kind of bacteria that's in this pile of stuff that's breaking down can affect the rate of how fast they break down. CO2, carbon dioxide, our greenhouse gas, is produced as a result. But you would already know that because you remember the carbon cycle very well, I'm sure. Here is the uh, table that shows us how fast it takes for different materials to break down. Paper towels, two to four weeks. Peels, orange peels, two to five. Paper, one to three months. You know, that's why if you leave your phone book on your driveway for a couple months, it just seems to disappear. Uh, cardboard, two months it can take. If you, a milk carton could take three months. Cloths that are actually cotton take five months. We're not talking about polyester here. We're talking about the real thing. And then plastic beverage bottles, 450 years. All right, we're talking about like those really thin bottles. And diapers take 450 years to break down. That means that if William Shakespeare himself, you know, old Billy Shakespeare here, had diapers like we have today, they'd still be around and in some museum probably. All right, that's gross, sorry. But anyway, glass can last forever. So if you don't properly recycle something that's made of glass, guess what, it's gonna be around. All right, so what is being done? Let's talk about regulations, because a lot is going on. The Bureau of Land Management, BLM, they work very hard with the EPA to ensure that land is properly sustained. So these two guys work well together. And then we have the Resource Conservation of Recovery Act, the RCRA. This gives the EPA control of transportation, treatment, storage, and disposal of hazardous waste. So hazardous waste go to them, and they're the ones that have to make sure it goes to a safe area. We also have the Comprehension Environmental Response of Compensation and Liability Act, the, C -R the C E R C L A. We call these super fun sites for short. And super funds are not super fun. Let me tell you. They are a site that got really bad. We're going to be doing, we're going to learn about super funds a little bit more in class. But super funds sites are areas in which there's so much hazardous waste that the EPA has got to come in, put some tape around that area, and clean it up. They also have brownfield sites. So like super fun sites are like Major League Baseball and brownfield sites are like Minor League Baseball. They're, they're not as bad as super funds in other words. Brownfields are abandoned industrial areas that could be a potential risk of the land and the water in the area. And the state will offer different programs to get them cleaned up. And there's many different types of programs we're gonna learn about they sometimes will just sell the area for a very low price as long as the business that takes the area promises to clean it up. Um, they do grants. They do like all these different things to try to get brownfield sites cleaned up because we don't just want all these abandoned nasty buildings everywhere. The EPA also monitors how land is being used with environmental assessments. So environmental assessments are a big part of the EPA. They will assess whenever a new building is being put in. Um, they will assess the quality of a building, how it's being maintained. It's, it's, it's really a big deal. Environmental assessments go a long way, and there are many, many, many pages. I had to write one for UConn, and it, it took me a whole semester. And then there are incentives that can be offered to businesses. I just talked about this. Or industries, and even, even houses, um, that if they clean up an area, it will work in sort of their benefit. Maybe they'll have tax regulations things like that. 
now we're going to get to the technology that is being done to limit the land pollution. Bioremediation is a very powerful player here and it uses the power of organisms to absorb the nutrients and toxins from the ground and we've been talking about that already when we talked about water management and how trees and plants can do that so this is very similar to that and there are natural microorganisms that are just really good at eating up different sorts of toxins and then phytoremediation is what we talked about in the water management that's when you use plants to absorb the nutrients and toxins from the ground so like you know you have a farmer that has a big farm and right next to them is a river if you just plant trees between the farm and the river the trees will soak up all the nutrients so you can do that too to get rid of toxins that enter the the ground monitor wells with sensors are used to sense contaminants especially when they are entering the water stream the groundwater and then materials that once were not biodegradable are now becoming biodegradable so we are using different like plastics that are more biodegradable or using paper instead of plastic just thinking things that will actually break down versus things that will not break down um, and you know there's many other technologies that aren't even on here but we've already talked about before like different incinerators different landfills with different liners and here's what the individual can do of course reduce reuse recycle Recycle is the weakest one out of the three R's. The biggest one is to reduce. Just stop using as much stuff. And then the stuff that you got to use, use it a couple times. Use it as many times as you can. And then when you're finally done with that thing, then you recycle. So again, out of the three, the most important one is to just reduce and use less things and try not to create four pounds of trash a day. Educating yourself on how to repair things goes such a long way. When people think when things are broken, they're broken, but you can fix things. You can, you can repair a certain component of a thing and make it good as new. You don't just have to replace the entire thing. People don't think that way anymore. It is harder to fix things now because everything's so compact, but still, there are ways to do it. Having your own compost pile in your house can really help out all those extra fruit and veggie scraps that you have you can just put them in a pile in your yard and they will break down over time and create as a result nutrient rich soil you just have to make sure that when you have a compost pile that the same amount of veggie and fruit scraps that you're putting in you're also putting in um, things like paper towel rolls and different paper and, and leaves you want those two things to to be equal. Buying products that last longer will really help reduce the amount of waste. And then properly disposing your batteries and your light bulbs. You can go to Best Buy, Lowe's, Home Depot to dispose those type of things. And, and um, if you are a business man or a business woman, you can, you can start a business on a brownfield site property and remediate the area. That's one great thing that an individual can do. So if you look at the top left corner here, you can see a compost pile that yours truly made um, for my condo. It's covered in snow right now, but it really was cool because the different people in our condo, we come together and we share that compost bin. And then in the spring, we use the soil from the compost bin. And the bottom right shows a diagram that that shows how phytoremediation works. And then the top right is a diagram that just shows basic bioremediation, biodegradation going on. All right, guys, that's all the information I have for you today. And as usual, I have some videos for you to enjoy. On the top left, I have a video that explains how to build a compost bin. The design that I picked here in this video I thought would be the best for West Hartford. On the top right, I have a video that explains how super funds work and where they are around the United States of America. On the bottom right, I, this woman is explaining how she's tackling bioremediation. And on the bottom left is an interesting one. It's a story of stuff for critique. So this guy basically rips apart everything that's going on in the, the story of stuff. Feel free to watch it. And um, I disagree with a lot of the information. Some of the information is actually not true. But it's interesting to hear the other side of things. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and take care.